And I just want to say now, next week, Angelina and I are going to be on a cruise. Because she's turned 50. In March. <laughs> but uh, a group of her cousins are turning 50 also. So anyhow, a long time ago, they put this cruise together in February last year sometime, and it's coming up. So anyhow, we're going to be uh, leaving on Saturday to spend about, tw you know, about 20, 25 other family members. So we're going to enjoy ourselves in the Caribbean. But I, I said all that to say this. Don't get preacher-itis on me. In other words, all the preacher's not going to be here, so we might as well not show up. Hey, John Adams is going to be here. Amen. John Amen. is a very good preacher. You're going to love him. Um, in fact, those of you that went to Greece and Israel, we partnered with his, his church. He's got a great word, a lot of energy, Amen. and you'll love John. John Adams and his wife, Diane, will be here. So you want to be come out because, you know, it's healthy for the church to listen um, uh, to other anointings, to other preachers, to other teachers that will bring in a, um, a, a fresh word, something from their personalities and uh, from what God is speaking to them. Healthy for the church to do that, to hear somebody other than me all the time. And so, but it's good. It, it brings a refreshing to the body of Christ. So just letting you know that. So John Adams will be here next week, but you'll love him. And uh, we'll be here, Lord willing, out there in the, uh, in the uh, parking lot, outdoors. <laughs> well, go ahead and take your outline out this morning as we look at a new series that we want to start in the next couple weeks, starting this week. On the, I'm calling it Holy Spirit 101. And I'd like to start with a verse that helps set this series up. And follow with me on your notes there in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. If, uh, if you know anything about the New Testament, it starts out with four counts talking about one story. That's the story of Jesus. And, um, and it's, it's called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it starts with the birth of Christ, follows it to the cross, the resurrection. Forty days after, Jesus revealed himself to a number of people, the risen Savior. And then he ascended into heaven. Then we have this fifth book called the Book of Acts. And this book is a historical record of this very first church, the early church. It's called the Apostolic Church. Um, and we see that. And what's interesting in the Book of Acts, it starts with the Holy Spirit. God sending the whole Jesus, sending the Holy Spirit there. And we see that ministry there. In fact, someone said it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit because we see that through the Book of Acts. In fact, as you, uh, someone noted that as you look at the end, the last chapter, the last verse in the book of Acts, it does not end with an amen because the Holy Spirit is continuously working amen. within generations and uh, in people's lives even now. So as we are in the 19th chapter into the history of this early church, it started decades ago. They say from Acts 1 to Acts 19, 20, 35 years now has, has transpired. And there, follow with me on your notes, while Apollos was at Corinth. Remember the book of Colossians or Corinthians? Remember that? This is where this book came from. It came, they were writing to the church of Colossae. The book of, and so Apollos, which was one of the teaching pastors, was sent by Paul to Corinth. And, Corinth, and Paul was ministering in Ephesus. And it says, and Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. This is where we get the book of Ephesians from. So Paul is there in Ephesus, and there he found some disciples, it says. These are believers, Christ followers. And Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, and here was their response, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, 2,000 years later, I just want to say, I wanted to kick this series off by saying this, that even in 2024... That's still the case today. There's a lot of people that do not understand the full ministry of the Holy Spirit. They love God. They know Jesus. Um, but they have not really experienced the fullness of the full potential of this wonderful person of the Godhead called the Holy Spirit. And I think some of the reasons are because the Holy Spirit over the years maybe has gotten a, a bad rap from time to time. A lot of people are afraid of it. A lot of people's theologies are not 
as based on, on the Bible, but based on certain experiences and they've seen on television and different things. And so there's some questions about that, about the Holy Spirit. I came in town in 1995 and Naples had an article there, big headlines that said this, speaking in tongues, snake handling, and Pentecostals. <laughs> and so anything about the Holy Spirit or anything, if you don't know anything about it, they'll look at that and go, we're not going to that church. Anybody that even talks about that. And so a lot of people say, well, I don't know anything about this Holy Ghost. In fact, I had one person tell me years ago, I'm afraid of ghosts. <laughs> you know, so there's confusion. There's a lot of confusion associated with the Holy Spirit that simply isn't true. So what I'm asking you today, as we come into this series, I want to explain to you the person of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not that it's an it or a ghost. It's a person. Right, it's part of the Godhead. That Jesus himself sent down to us. And I want to show you how important and how vitally important his role is to us in our hearts and in our lives. And I want to somehow, if I can use this word, I don't know if there's a word I'm going to make it up. I want to de spookify <laughs> or demystify in a bit of some of this man-made sensationalism that happens from time to time. And at the same time, we, we need to be open to it and receive everything that God has for it in our lives. I'm telling you, it's, it, he will enhance your life. He's here to introduce Christ to you. He entered, he, he's entered into your heart and into your life. The Holy Spirit's job is to make Jesus more real to our hearts and our lives. You know, as your pastor, it's my job to lead and to feed. And as your, as, as your shepherd... We, are going to, we take you on these biblical journeys. So I'm asking you today, as we go into this series, come in with a blank sheet, a blank paper, a piece of paper, and, and not bring in some of the negative experiences that maybe you've grown up with or maybe have as it relates to the Holy Spirit. But hear and read and be open to God, what God might have for you to get a fresh encounter of this incredible person called the Holy Spirit that I believe the devil doesn't want us to be involved with. He wants to eliminate us from that, you know, and cause all of this misconceptions and preconception ideas. And so we just throw the baby out with the bathwater and we miss out on what God has for us. So I want to introduce to you, to him today, what I want us to do on your outline, look at the nature of the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at the word itself. In fact, the English Bible come, has two words that uses to describe the Holy Spirit. In some of your translations, it's the word spirit, and another translation is the word ghost. So either one, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, and we see that these terms are used over 800 times in the Bible. And as you know, the Word of God is written in two languages. The Old Testament was written in the original language called Hebrew. It was written in a Hebrew language, and the New Testament was written in in Greek. So I want to give you a little theology on your outline and we hopefully will bring some clarity to some of this so that we can understand it. We're call, calling this Holy Spirit 101. Amen. We're going back to the basics so I, we can get an understanding, a foundation of this incredible person that God has given us. So on your outline, I'm going to teach you a little Hebrew. I'm going to make sure I get it right. <clears throat> I wrote it down for you. Look on your outline. Roha. You gotta act like you got something caught in the back of your throat. I'm gonna teach you a little Hebrew. That's this is the, this is the Hebrew word used for the spirit. Roh. Turn to your neighbor and go roh. Don't spit on it. Roh. You gotta say it. You gotta to be a Hebrew. You be a Jewish. You gotta have it with a little like you're, you're coughing up something. And that is the definition of the, well, that's the word the Old Testament uses for spirit, or in the King James, in the Old King James, it's, they, they, they call it ghost. So it's, it means this, a wind, a breath, a blast of, of a breath. That's what it means. In fact, we see it used, the Holy Spirit shows up on your outline, the second verse of the Old, of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 1, it says this. Now the earth was formless, this is the creation account, and empty darkness is over the surface of the deep, and the what? Spirit of God. Circle spirit there. That's that there. And it's the breath of God, the wind of God. 
And, and, and he was part of the creation that hovered over the waters. I often, when I open up in prayer, I, I think about this, where the Holy Spirit hovered over the, 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 the formless earth that God had and breathed life into it. And when I pray sometimes, I say, God, I want your Holy Spirit to hover. I want the breath of God to come into our place. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand the very word of the Holy Spirit. And so that you can understand its nature. Then, then we go into the New Testament. And it's the Greek word there, pneuma. Say pneuma. pneuma. And that word is used in the Greek language to describe spirit, the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. And it's the definition, a current of air, a blast of breath, is a strong breeze. So as the translators are looking at these two words and asking, how, how are we going to call God? Are we going to do God the breath, God the air? You know, so they use spirit. And then in 1611, they use the word ghost, Holy Ghost, you know, in their translation. So Jesus uses this word pneuma on your outline, John 6, 63. He was saying every time Jesus speaks your Bible, it says this, as you read the Bible, the words I have spoken to you are what? Spirit, that's that Greek word pneuma. Wind, a strong breeze. In them. Therefore, they are life. That word life means they bring life to you. That's why I'm telling you why this Bible is, is the most unusual book in, the, in written. Because this is the very word of God. And Jesus says that the words I have spoken, and we see his words spoken, they have life. There's that pneuma. The Spirit of God is on that. And we see that word pneuma means that the, that the words on the pages of God's word uh, aren't, are, are, aren't normal. They're just, they're, they're, they're there, but they have the breath of God. That's why when we speak many times, your, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So as the word of God is going forth, it's God's pneuma, God's word, God is God's spoken word. And it energizes, it's active, it's alive. That's why people often come up to me and they say to me often at the park sometimes, I felt like you were speaking directly to me. I even had one person say, did my wife call you to say that? <laughs> I'm not that smart. But this is, this is God speaking. This word of God, God breathed. In fact, it says there in, um, in 2 Timothy, it's not on your outline, but write down 2 Timothy 16. Every scripture is given by inspiration. God breathed. And so we see that pneuma. And that's why we, we need the breath of God. And that's what I want you to experience inwardly. Sometimes our Christianity gets a little stale, a little crusty. And, you know, and sometimes it's rote and, 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 and robotic. I want to let you know when the Spirit of God breathes His life in us and, and renews us, it brings, it brings an aliveness. It's living. It's, it's active in our spirit. Some people say, why are you so passionate when you speak? I don't know. It's just in me. It's that it's that it's the new of God Amen. that makes our experience come alive. In fact, John says, Jesus will I come to baptize you with water, but Jesus will come to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Mm -hmm. So there's that pneuma, that, that aliveness that happens in our hearts and our lives. So on your outline, let's take this roha, this pneuma, this blast of air, this wind. And let's look, look at, let's look at four characteristics of the Holy Spirit using this characteristic of wind. How they parallel with the Holy Spirit. And, 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 his, and, his, and the words, the definitions mean that. So we can understand the person of the Holy Spirit. Number one, wind is unseen. You know, you know we've experienced this in our park. We get these wind advisories, these wind alerts, these, these, these weather fronts that happen. We get this gust of wind that blows in our face and moves our hair. There's days when I walk out, and in the summertime, it is dog hot. I mean, stuffy hot, uh, humidity. And every once in a while, we get into this fall time of the year, we get that fresh breeze that blows us in our face, and it feels so good. And when we come to our experience with God... Isn't it nice to say, boy, that feels good. Boy, don't, I mean, what, did, didn't church feel good? You know, your heart's lifted, your faith is encouraged. You know, I used to hear people growing up in church say, brother, you're not supposed to be running on your feelings. But it sure feels good to feel what you're running on every once in a while. 
It really feels good to know it. And a lot of times, tell me if you experience this. The wind of God comes in. The new of God comes in. And you feel these goosebumps. Man, I was out in the parking place the other day and talking to somebody. In fact, I was doing a hospital visit. And as I was, as I was praying and talking to this couple, all of a sudden, the presence, I felt the presence of God come in. I mean, and they felt it. They, they, they sensed it in the room. It's a, that wind, that pneuma is unseen. It comes in. And I felt it. And I had one guy said, well, these are not goosebumps. They're Holy Ghost bumps. <laughs> you know? And you get those Holy Ghost bumps. Amen. Because the wind blows in. The pneuma of God comes in. And, and, and that's what that word means. We can feel it. My prayer every Sunday that you, me, us, that we would be... In, that you would not just be that you would not be impressed by the springs because it's outdoors, supposed to be outdoors, or my dynamic preaching. I, that's a joke. Supposed to laugh at that. But I want you to have a moment in the message and worship where you go, "Oh my goodness, God is here, Amen. and He's changing my life." Amen. I can sense His presence, the pneuma, the wind of God. Look at you know John on your outline, John fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Jesus is with His disciples. At the Last Supper, Thursday's the he's, he's there on Thursday. I mean, and he's going on the cross. His last conversation with the with the disciples was all about the Holy Ghost. In fact, your outline should be your homework should be John fourteen fifteen and sixteen. Go home and read all of that. John fourteen fifteen sixteen. The last conversation Jesus had, he was talking about. He says, "You're not going to see me anymore. I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to ascend to heaven. I'm going to sit on the right hand of the Father. I'm going to make intercession for you." But you will not be alone. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he gives three chapters about this Holy Spirit that he's about ready to send out. And on, on in, in John 14 on your outline, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, and here's an interesting word, advocate. Some, some translations say comforter or counselor. And look at what his job is. Not to, 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 to spook us out or to freak us out, but to help you. And to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him. Sometimes the world might even laugh at it because it neither sees him. When people can't see something or understand it in their minds, they feel uncomfortable. They can't handle that part of, uh, of God that is felt that way. The unseen nature, the presence of God that comes in. And then it says, then God cannot, then the world cannot accept this because they neither see him. Therefore, they never know God. But you know him. For he lives within you and will be in you. You can't see God, but you know he's there. Yes, amen. Amen? Yes, amen. You know, have you ever seen God visibly? No. But you sense him. You feel him. He's in our hearts when he asks you to come in. And, and, and you know what? We can come from a dry, weary week and get a little wind in ourselves. That's what we're supposed to do as we gather together. Get a little pneuma blowing in our in ourselves. So that we can have a personal encounter with him every single day. You know, last week I had a young Spanish man come up to me after the service last week. And he runs up to me and he says, Pastor, this is my third week being here. And I'm going to tell you something. This is wonderful. Man, I have got it. Yet. I, I, I mean, God is speaking to me. And this young man out of the blue, I had an older man come up to me years ago with tears streaking down his cheeks. And says, he says, do not change what you do in his park. Amen. And what is he, why, why is he saying that? Because of the pneuma, the wind of God, God's spirit blowing in. And so we see that, that wind is unseen. Number two, our natural wind parallels with the Holy Spirit. Wind is unpredictable. It was shipped on you. Every day, I, every week I look at those flags out there and see the wind's coming in from the north. The wind's coming in from the south. You know, airports have that. They, they have those wind meters. And a lot of people, you know, they, they, they're a little bit uncomfortable with that part of God. You know, we, we, like our, we like our God to be all tucked in and orderly, which we believe in order. But, many, but how many knows that God can be outside the box many times? God can mess you up a little bit, you know, in a good way. And, ha and, and, and have you discovered God doesn't fit, doesn't do it the same way every time? And why doesn't... And, 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 and you know why he doesn't do it the same way every time? We end up worshiping the system and not him. And what happens? We start worshiping the feelings. And we start worshiping the experience and the high. 
And all of a sudden we get more into the little fanaticisms and all that. But all of a sudden, we came at the same time. We had a statement of faith and truth. We're solid. We're unchangeable. Uh, I mean, our doctrine is sound, very predictable, doctrinal, and, and, and biblical structure. But at the same time, we welcome the unpredictability nature of God when he comes to embrace that when God sh shows up unexpectedly. We welcome that because we're being led by the Spirit based on solid biblical truth. That never changes. Look at John 3 on your outline. The wind. Time out. That word wind. Guess what the Greek word is for that? Pneuma. This is the one place where we translate it. It actually translates it. Wind. Blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. pneuma. The spirit. The Holy Spirit has an unpredictability to his nature. You know, one time God talked to a man from a burning bush. God never did that again. I mean, he talked to Moses one time, boom, out of a burning bush. If that happened today, we would have had a denomination called burning bush denomination. <laughs> we have made an institution out of that. One time, God did it. One time, boom, the unpredictability. He's out there doing his sheep, and all of a sudden, boom, God comes to a burning bush. One time, Jesus was out there and he saw a man that was blind. But you know what Jesus did this time? Yes. <laughs> I'm dramatizing, dramatizing. <laughs> In the mud. He made mud out of his spit and put it on the man's eye. Can you believe his friends? That man just spit in the mud. But God used that one time. The unpredictability of how God just moves in. And that's what the scripture is saying. The wind goes wherever it blows. And the spirit of God is there. And I'm here to tell you, we, we, we got to be careful not to tuck God into something that only our brain can understand and, and different things. Many times we miss out on future blessings. Many times, many churches and many, and many Christians miss the blessing in the midst of the blessings. Good, because the church gets stuck. In fact, the Pharisees that way. The Pharisees missed out on what God was going to do. They were so stuck in their Old Testament and they added rules. And here comes Jesus coming on the scenes. And all of a sudden, you know how that ended. You know that Jesus Revolution movie? You had hippies getting saved. I know I got some Woodstock people in here. I, I look out there. I mean, I mean, if you come out in this rain like that, you're a Woodstock crowd. And you still got a little horniness in you. Bless God, I'm going out for Jesus. You know? But listen, you know, that, that, that revolution, it, it upset the apple cart back then. The mainline denominations couldn't accept that. We had hippies coming in with flip-flops and flowers and everything. And they're coming in and they were messing up. And that was the movement that came into my town in Newport News, Virginia in the 70s. And we had a group of us young people that got turned on to Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, we were so turned on to Jesus that we were literally carry our Bibles to school on top of our books. And we made sure it was on top of the math book. Right. Amen. We want everybody to know that we were Christians. That's how it turned on that 1970 move of God happened. And I'm telling you, we out of that church, out of our church there in Bethel Temple in Newport News, five of us went into the ministries. Out of that people. We split off and went into Bible colleges. And they're in ministry today. In ministry today. Because of this experience of God that came in out of the blue. And it came in so unpredictably. And thank God I had a pastor there that embraced that. And so that's what I'm saying. The wind, the nature of God. I'm trying to get you back to Holy Ghost 101, Holy Spirit 101. To understand what's the nature of this pneuma, this wind. And just look at this. And number three, wind is powerful. It can generate electricity. It can sell ships. It can destroy a city. We know that in Florida. We witnessed the power of a natural wind. Many of you that are here today and some of you, and those of you that are watching us online, there are circumstances and things that human power cannot fix. It is a tragic that we tragic that we distance ourselves from the power of God because we have packaged it in such a way that it that, that turns us off. 
I plead and implore to you to get close to the person of the Holy Spirit and experience this next verse on your outline. But you will receive what? Power. When what? The Holy Spirit comes on you. You know the word power there is the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamo from? Where we get the word dynamite from? You will receive dynamo. And Lord, and we can say, Lord, I'm facing some things in my life that human power cannot fix. Amen. But we need to tap into a supernatural power. Amen. I thank God for the supernatural power. Yes. Yes. I'm a preacher, and you heard me say this. I believe if he did it in the Old Testament, he's going to do it in 2024. Right. Come on now. Amen. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. We have the ability to tap into that. And the Holy Spirit makes that come alive. I read about Charles Finney. Who was a martyr? Who was considered the father of modern day re, uh, revival? He did what we call the Second Great Awakening in, the, in American history in the 1840s. He was a 19th century attorney slash Presbyterian pastor minister, and in his own words, he was comfortable knowing God and what he called the intellectual level only. So now he's getting hungry for God, and it's in his writings. God used him tremendously. Back in the day, tremendous moves of God under his ministry. He encountered the Holy Spirit. Let me read you a paragraph of what happened to him in his own words. I quote, the Holy Spirit descended on me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I would feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. For I could not express it in any other way. It seems like the very breath of God settled in on me. Exactly the definition we're talking about. The pneuma, the breath of God. And there are some that are here today and watching us online here. You're on mission critical. In, in your marriage, in your job, in, with your kids, with your health, with your emotions, and even... Better yet, your Christianity, you need a fresh wind of God. You need a fresh wind to blow into yourselves, to lift you up, and God can do that. And then last characteristic of wind is refreshing. Have you ever been in a hot car in summertime, windows rolled up, 120 degrees, parked in the sun, and all of a sudden you roll that window down, and all of a sudden that wind blows in? How refreshing? The Holy Spirit wants to refresh us. Look at 1 Corinthians 2. It says, if your eye saw everything God wanted you to see, your eye could not believe it. If your ear could hear, your ear wouldn't understand it. In fact, your mind can't even hold what God has prepared for those who loved him. He wants to give you and us what God has revealed to us, is revealed to us by his pneuma, by his spirit. So I'm asking God to come in in these next four weeks to introduce us to this incredible experience called the Holy Spirit. More of God in 24. And by doing that is allowing us to flow in his spirit. Now look at Ephesians 4, 30 on your outline. Don't grieve God. Don't reject something God gave you. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit, watch this, moving in what? Breathing in you. It's the most intimate part of your life. Make you fit for himself. Don't take this gift for granted. So real quickly, four things, real quickly, a couple things here. How to allow the Holy Spirit to come become more prominent in your life. Number one, write this down. Let go of fears and pre-perceptions that you come across with. Let go of fears and pre-perceptions that really a lot of times aren't based on the Bible. We all have them as it relates to God and particularly as it relates to the Holy Spirit. Fears and pre-conceptions and pre-perceptions. And we have our list, but we need to go to God, like I said, with a blank page and say, God, if this is for me, I want it. And allow his spirit to lead you. You know, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is not unbiblical nor out of date. It's not spooky or weird. God has a good thing for us. In fact, Luke eleven thirteen, it's not on your outline, write this down. Luke eleven thirteen says, if you then know how, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Right, amen. So I want us to come in today hungry, blank slate, and say, God, if this is for you, I want it, and you do your research on it. I'm going to tell you, God's going to lead you into a deeper, a deeper experience with Him and His Holy Spirit. And then number two, 
I, you know, I, I just encourage you to take a different posture towards the Holy Spirit and go all in. You know, I've discovered you can't just go halfway with God. People say, you know, I'm ready to give my heart to Jesus, but I'll see you in three, four, five weeks. Everyone. I'll just tip God. I'll just fit God in. And you'll never find the best that God has for you just halfway. And at some point, you're going you're gonna, to you understand the power that God has in your life. And you want to test this thing out. And I'm asking you, go all in with God. And God will, you will never be disappointed. In fact, in Jeremiah 29, it says, you will seek me and find me when? You seek me with your whole heart. When you seek me with your whole heart. I would say, go all in. Allow God this year to express himself in ways I'm telling you, the ministry of the Holy Spirit will open up to you and he'll lead you and he paths. You'll look back on this and go, why didn't I do this earlier? And then number three and final, I want you to develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. An intimate friendship. Ultimately, this is his role and purpose for your life. That God, the Father, has a role. The Holy Spirit, the, the Jesus his son has a different role, and the Holy Spirit has his role. In fact, all three of those roles are in one verse on your outline. It's actually a benediction. We know about benedictions or closing prayers. It's there on your outline in 1 Corinthians. Many times we close our service with a benediction. Out of number six, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Ever heard that? That's a benediction right out of Numbers. And this is a benediction here on your outline. We see all three, we see the Trinity mentioned here, all three serving in different roles. And it says this, the New King James Version, check out the different roles. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. This is my prayer for you today. That you would understand each of these roles. Now look at the next verse in the Message Bible. Same thing. The amazing grace of the master, Jesus. The extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, here's my concern. A lot of times we go after God the Father. We go after God the Son. But we do not tap into the fullness and the, and the, and the freedom that's in the Holy Spirit. So in closing, write this down. God the Father, his role is just to love me. His extravagant love. You might be here today in the park or here today and the love of the Father. For many of you, you cannot receive God's love because maybe your earthly father and the devil did that so that you'll never be able to relate to your father in the right way. But I want to let you know God wants to heal that in your relationship so that you can understand the love of, the, uh, love of God the Father. He wants to wrap his love around you in everlasting love. You know, God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. If God had a refrigerator, he would put your picture on it. <laughs> That's how much in love he is. And look, look at that. It says, this is the love of God. This is the role of the Father. And you need to let him allow him to wrap his arms around you. Yes, amen. And you're going to say, well, how, how are you sure that he's mad about me. Well, you can, all, you can always tell the value of something by what another person is willing to pay for that something. That's good. Amen. Come on. So what was God willing to pay? His son, which brings us to the next. In fact, John 3, 16 says, God so, God so loved the world, so loved you, that he did something I don't know if I could do. I love you. But we only have one son. His name is Joshua David Wynn. I don't think I, I would have to draw the line to lay his life down for you. But God loved you so much. Amen. He said, son, you're going to have to put some flesh on. You have to get down to love that we made in my image. Satan has baboozled him. We've got to rescue him. So he sent his son. Amazing grace, which is number two. Jesus has a role. God the Son saves me. Remember, it's the grace of God. You remember Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound. You know that verse? A saved day. Wretch like me. I was once lost, but I was blind. But now I see. Thank God for Jesus.
That's why our songs is all about Jesus. That's why we're going to do communion here in a moment. It all focuses to the cross because he paid it. He paid a bill that I couldn't pay. I love that old song talking about uh, Jesus' revolution and back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. There used to be an old chorus that said that we used to sing and we, we sung the mess out of it. And it would go <laughs> like this. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt. Remember it? I could not pay. I needed someone. To wash my sins away. And now I sing that brand new song. Amazing grace. For Christ Jesus paid a debt. That I could never pay. He went to the cross. Took the punishment. Took our shame. Took our guilt. He saved us. That's his role. But so many people stuck. Were the there at the Trinity. We, we got God the Father. God the Son. But then there's the role my friend. Of the Holy Spirit. Which is awesome. Amen. Which I close with this. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to be with you. More of God in 24. And so many of Christians today and believers, they need some fresh wind in their sails. I mean, we work hard and our walk with God sometimes can be doldrum, inactive, going through the motions of religiosity, and you're about ready to die. You're as dry. I'm from the South, Virginia. There used to be a statement, used to go, a saying that goes like that. You were as dry as last year's bird nest. <laughs> That's pretty dry, yeah. I mean, you know, you come in the trees, shed the leaves, and all of a sudden you look and there's a bird nest, no life in there. It's dry. And I used to hear a preacher say, man, some of you are as dry as last year's bird nest. You need the pneuma of God. You need the raw, the raw, the wind of the Holy Spirit to come and freshen you. As we open our hearts up to the Lord. So take your communion cup, would you? And let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We're going to combine this prayer and our communion together. And in an attitude of prayer. Lord, take us on this journey as a church. We let go of our fears and misperceptions. We all want, we want to dive in and go all in. To find you and to seek you with all of our hearts. And Lord, help us to understand this biblical topic to develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Some of you don't have maybe have a relationship with God and some of you that are watching me online here today. You've walked away from God or maybe you're carrying your own shame and guilt and you need to receive the love of the Father. You need to, you need to, re be, you need to step across the line and ask Christ to, just to touch you in your heart and your life. You need to receive him back. And God is speaking to your heart. Would you right here, maybe online, just, or even here, if yeah, that's you, would you lift, let God know by lifting your hands and include me in this prayer? Right there in that line or even here. Say, God, conclude me in this prayer. I need you to come back into my life. I need you to fully. And let's pray this prayer with me before we take communion. Just say, God, thank you for loving me. Say it in your heart. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Today I receive your love and I receive your salvation. Forgive me for living my life without you. Today I fully surrender to you. Come live inside of me. Change me. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. And now as we take this communion today, go ahead and remove the, the wafer that you have there. You know what communion? The Holy Spirit uses communion to point us back to Christ. His job is to make Jesus dynamically real in your heart, the Holy Spirit. So as we're talking about the Holy Spirit today, the Holy Spirit, his job is to introduce you to not just with salvation, but beyond that. To get us into a deeper walk with God and communion allows us to look back and say thank you for the tremendous love of the Father and the sacrifice of the Son. And because we have Jesus in our life, we're open to this incredible ministry called the Holy Spirit. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. Let's eat together. Christ's body was broken for us so he can take our brokenness and restore it back to health again. In Jesus' name. And then he took the cup when he gave him thanks, when he gave thanks, said this, drink it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. 
I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's drink together. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that covers our shame, our guilt. And thank you, Lord, for living in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Wendy, would you come? And I just want to say today, as we give this introduction to the Holy Spirit 101, allow the pneuma, the, 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 the power, the, 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 the freshness of God, just bless your hearts today and open, and open yourself up to Him. Thank you for your generosity. And as you leave here today, thank you. Our offering baskets are in the back. And thank you for your faithfulness and your giving today, enabling to serve God in our community and around the world. Our prayer team will be up front here. If you need special prayer today, they are here. Let's stand as we leave today. And listen, it's not raining outside. God bless you as you leave today. Amen. When you going to take us out? Amen. <laughs>